you know, it doesn't look like we've got any attendees on yet. Uh, so Steve, just bear in mind that um, when people do start joining, you might just want to say we'll be getting going in a few minutes or something. Sure. Uh, shall I start at one minute past? Then. Yeah, I mean, but yes, probably a good idea. Okay. Oh. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to our next installment of the APAC Forum. My name is uh, Steve Namazavayam, and I'm in charge of our industry alliances uh, and our membership program here at the Wireless Broadband Alliance. And today I'll be moderating the session. Um, we'll be covering off uh, briefly the objectives behind the forum, and then I'll be giving a brief update on our recent Wireless Global Congress and our executive plenary session. Then my colleague, Pedro Muta, uh, we'll be giving a, an overview of the WBA industry roadmap. And then we're fortunate to also be joined today by uh, Devashish Bachacharan from Broadband India Forum, who will be giving an overview of the Wi-Fi landscape in India. And then later on, we have a recording from Christian Gabetta, who is MD for Heights Telecom in Switzerland on residential broadband as well. Okay. Throughout the, the uh, session, uh, there'll be opportunities for the audience to uh, to ask questions. Uh, so feel free to post any questions uh, through the chat functionality. So moving on, um, I just want to kick off by just giving a big bit of background to the APAC forum. Um, this forum is some, something the leadership team in the WBA and some of the prominent members started around two years ago. Um, we decided that with challenges that we're facing in, in APAC, with regards to Wi-Fi connectivity, that the WBA was in a prime position uh, to lend its resources and its expertise and knowledge um, to, to, the, to, to the region um, and letting learnings that we found and re, you know, recent uh, white papers and resources, uh, giving those to the region in order to enable them to, to combat some of the issues that we're seeing as well. Okay. Um, at that time, and you can see who the leadership here is, it's our, our CEO, Tiago Rodriguez, and our CTO, Bruno Tomas, and myself, along with some uh, prominent me um, members from um, CDOT, Cirrus, HFCL, Telstra, and CityRoom. Um, we identified these topics as the most important ones uh, that we can lend our resources and our expertise to in, in, in APAC. So lack of rural connectivity, digital poverty, convergence between Wi-Fi and cellular and also private networks, residential Wi-Fi, how we can uh, achieve more seamless, secure and private Wi-Fi, public Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi 6C and now 7, um, and then equipment lead times uh, due to component shortages uh, following the pandemic and then skilled resources due to closed borders as well. Okay. Um, moving forward, I'm now just going to give a, a brief overview on our recent Wireless Global Congress that we hosted in Las Vegas uh, from, from June the 19th to the 22nd as well. Okay. Um, I also want to thank all the sponsors uh, that made the Congress uh, possible. Uh, without them, um, it wouldn't be possible to host such events as well. So a big thank you to all of those involved. And I also now just want to share the agenda for the opening morning uh, from the Congress as well. So you can see our CEO, Tiago Rodriguez, gave the opening welcome address. Uh, we also had Michael Lee Sherwood, who is the Chief Innovation and Technology Officer from the City of Las Vegas, join us. And Matt McPherson, who is a CTO, uh, wireless CTO from Cisco. And Eric McLaughlin, 
he was talking about enterprise Wi-Fi. Eric is a VP uh, and GM for Wireless Solutions. And then finally, Bill Marino from Boingo Wireless, who is the Vice President for Data Engineering. And he talked about the role of AI in 5G and Wi-Fi 6 network management. Okay, so just jumping in, um, Tiago opened the session but just by acknowledging some significant milestones in the history of the Wireless Broadband Alliance. So we celebrated our 20th year anniversary. Uh, so the WBA, just for those of you who don't know, was launched uh, on the 20th of March 2003. And we celebrated 20 years uh, in the Cong in, in Vegas uh, at the Congress, which was very nice on the 20th of June. Uh, and you can see we uh, we marked the occasion uh, with a special uh, cake cutting ceremony. So you can see Tiago uh, is the one with knife in hand that's cutting through the cake along with uh, Derek Peterson, who's the CTO from, uh, from Boeing Wireless. Okay, moving on. Uh, on. Tiago also marked, uh, I guess, some of the significant milestones over the course of our 20 year history. Um, so back in 2003 to 2008, WBA was conducting the first uh, trials for Wi-Fi roaming. We developed the first set of standards, uh, RICS, Wireless Roaming Intermediate Exchanged. Uh, and we also um, established uh, an authentication framework with the uh, FIX Mobile uh, Convergence Alliance, FMCA as well. Okay. In around 2009 to 2013, uh, we launched our NGH Next Generation Hotspot Program, and we entered into a joint collaboration for Wi-Fi roaming with the GSMA, um, and also collaborations with the Wi-Fi Alliance and Small Cell Forum as well. Okay. Um, around that time, we also started to launch our, our public events, our wireless global congresses, um, and the NGH program uh, continued to gather more and more momentum as well. Around 2016-17, uh, we launched our Connected Cities Advisory Board. Uh, we also launched the uh, World Wi-Fi Day celebration. Um, the technical assets, the RICS uh, documentation, was updated to reflect uh, Passpoint and IoT. We also established a Wi-Fi and cellular convergence program, and we enlarged our technical roadmap to include Wi-Fi 6, IoT, in-home, and policy, policy and regulatory affairs as well. Okay. Um, in more recent years, uh, we've also added projects such as connected vehicle, Wi-Fi sensing, in-flight Wi-Fi, industrial IoT, QoS, and in-home Wi-Fi and rural Wi-Fi to the program as well. And we established a, a very strong trials program for Wi-Fi 60 and Wi-Fi 7 uh, as well. Okay. Um, our work on convergence continued uh, with Wi-Fi 6C and Wi-Fi um, and, 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 and private cellular and 5G. Um, we continue to establish more collaborations and liaisons with other industry bodies. Today, you'll be hearing from the Broadband India Forum. Um, we also launched Open Roaming um, Standard and PKI uh, two, two years, three years ago uh, as well. And we also migrated our legal entity to the US uh, as well and applied to be an AFC operator in the United States as well. Okay. Today, we're pleased to announce uh, that Open Roaming exists in more than 3 million locations. Uh, we're also in the process of launch, launching a sustainability task group. And as I mentioned, we're celebrating 20 years of the WBA with, with 200 members as well. Okay. Um, moving forward, um, Tiago was um, kind enough to share his travel experience uh, from where he's, he's normally located in Lisbon uh, through to Las Vegas. Um, and I think what this demonstrates is that there's clearly a still a lot of friction. So from Tiago's you know, starting point in Lisbon Airport to connect to the Wi-Fi, it took him three clicks. Um, and he was also presented with this page where he's told it's an unsecured network at the airport. Um, that continued uh, when he uh, basically um, was able to, to see the, um, the, the, his transit point in Amsterdam as well. So again, required free clicks and this message saying it's an unsecured network. And then on the in-flight service uh, en route to, uh, to Las Vegas, required five clicks to connect. And again, a, a message sharing it was an unsecured network. Okay. And then at his, um, his final, um, I guess, um, point in, in the United States in Las Vegas, at Harry Reid International Airport, again, uh, had to click three times uh, to connect to the Wi-Fi network and was given this message that it's unsecure, okay. Um, it did get a bit better. So as he made his way to the uh, Renaissance Hotel, 
where we were hosting the Congress, he was able to seamlessly connect. So no clicks um, and no messages about unsecure networks. Whilst Tiago was there, he also uh, had to conduct some business on behalf of the WBA and visit one of the banks nearby. And again, required free clicks to connect and a message saying it was unsecure. Um, he also uh, was uh, nearby the Venetian Hotel. Uh, again, three clicks to connect and was unsecure. And then also visited this restaurant, the Canaletto. And fortunately that location uh, was enabled with open roaming, required no clicks and was seamless as well. Okay. So the reason why we decided to share this is that it's still after 20 odd years of, of Wi-Fi, you know, being a, an access technology, um, still not perfect. Uh, we can see that an experience such as, you know, a lot of us will, will travel for, for, for business and for, for pleasure. Um, when we try to connect to Wi-Fi, it's still not seamless and still doesn't appear to be secure. Okay. Um, I'll move forward. Uh, I also want to share um, some insights. We were fortunate to have uh, Michael Lee Sherwood. Again, he's Chief Information and Technology Officer from the city of Las Vegas. Um, and he came along to share what Las Vegas is doing as far as wireless connectivity is concerned as well. Okay. So Las Vegas, we, um, we're pleased to share, has a very strong program for wireless connectivity. Um, the focus areas, as you can see, for social economic development, for education, public safety, mobility, health and, and, and wellness. Um, back in 2016, the uh, Las Vegas established an innovation district um, and I opened up a innovation center in 2019 uh, as well, uh, and also their second innovation center in 2020 as well. Quite interesting, one of the use cases that Michael shared was on the autonomous vehicles um, and what they've established here in, in Las Vegas as well back in 2017. Okay. Um, also, we were pleased to have uh, Matthew McPherson, who's the wireless CTO from San Francisco. He came along, he shared some of the trends uh, that we're seeing from a, a data consumption perspective. Uh, I think generally the message here is that in markets such as Germany, Portugal, the UK, uh, over the last 10 years, uh, the traffic has increased uh, five to 10 times as well. Okay. Also, um, Matt uh, talked extensively about open roaming. Um, and some of the trends that we're seeing in terms of attachment rates. So per the slides that I shared earlier and Tiago's experience on route to from, from, from Lisbon to Las Vegas, um, what Cisco are seeing when effectively they've helped, um, and in this particular instance, you know, a very large healthcare organization in the United States uh, enable open roaming is that the attachment rate increased uh, more than four times uh, over, I think it was the course of a few weeks as well. Okay. Also um, represented what was what we're seeing in terms of in, uh, IoT uh, and how Wi-Fi is still effectively uh, you know, carrying a lot of the traffic uh, and how it's perceived as important. So you can see that Wi-Fi comes out as if, as far as an unlicensed technology, um, and the use use case it still comes out as as number one as well. Okay. Um, moving forward. We also had Eric McLaughlin, who's the VP and GM for Wireless Solutions at Intel join us. Um, Eric focused his presentation on enterprise Wi-Fi uh, and some of the trends and what we're seeing in terms of hybrid work. Uh, we have nomadic employees, uh, we have corporate networks, personal networks, public networks being used uh, when people are conducting their, you know, their work affairs. Many different devices, BYID, uh, devices that are given by, uh, you know, by the employer themselves, third party devices. Uh, we have convergence um, between Wi-Fi and cellular. Uh, we have, I guess, you know, what um, Eric described as advanced use cases. So for video conferencing, for AR, for VR uh, as well. Uh, we also have um, to consider things such as asset tracking uh, and spectrum sharing as well. Okay. Um, and some of the evolutions that we're seeing in terms of intelligent networks and end-to-end -end QoS, uh, in fact, a program that we're running within the WBA, uh, how to manage you know, the various networks and the, and the client devices, analytics uh, being used uh, in enterprise as well, as well as uh, the emergence of client AI as well. Okay. I think uh, an important takeaway uh, and a call to action from, from Eric during his presentation 
is that collaboration is key. So whilst Intel, who are very good innovators, Cisco, who are very good innovators, um, the key takeaway message is that basically we, we can work uh, more closely um, and come together. That is better for, for the industry and seeing how we can actually um, you know, develop standards, uh, more standards uh, you know, amongst us as well. Okay. Um, so I want to share the, the Congress actually lasted for two days. Uh, what I shared was the, the opening sort of plenary you know, summary. Um, the full presentations and recordings can be accessed via our website as well. So I'm sharing this link here uh, that you can go to, uh, to to obtain those presentations and recordings. I would urge you, uh, you know, to, to go and do that as well. It was very informative uh, and you can hear from a lot of other great uh, thought leaders uh, in the industry as well. Okay. Um, okay. So moving forward, back to the agenda, just doing a quick time check. Um, I want to invite my colleague Pedro Muta uh, to step forward and provide an overview of the technology roadmap within the Alliance. So Pedro, uh, welcome and over to you. Thanks so much, Steve. Very good. Welcome everyone as well. Good morning, good afternoon. Uh, very happy to be here with you as well and to provide a quick update in terms of where WBA is and the work that the WBA members are doing in terms of developing the 2023 roadmap. So without further ado, I would propose that we share here the very brief set of slides just really to show you where we are. And we'll have the chance as well to talk a little bit about the the new APEC task group activity that is being as well outlined for the for the upcoming months or right to start. Very well. So let me just hide here the floating meeting controls. Hopefully you guys can can see fully the screen. Uh, very well. So as always, right, the WBA is organized on this work group uh, vertical. Let me just see if we can. Uh, Okay, very well. I hope you can see um, organized in terms of these verticals, right? So with the 5G, the IoT, the next gen, the roaming, the open roaming work group, and also the testing interoperability work group. And then, of course, uh, following uh, as well on the bottom side, you can find the policy and regulatory affairs work group with the market as well work group. And finally, the certification task group. So these are the key pillars and verticals of WBA. Therefore, you can find uh, within them the specific projects, right? So the difference being, once again, that the work Groups, they are permanent over time. They have rotating leadership or, or shares mandates. And then beneath those work groups, we have the projects that have a specific mission and scope, uh, which typically is accomplished at a certain point in time from six to 12 months. And then the, that project specifically is over. So where we are right now, you can see here that in terms of the, the 5G work, the way carries on, you know, performing a very important role in terms of the, the convergence between 5G and Wi-Fi world, in this case, for the enterprise sector, for the private 5G networks coming up with a second deliverable to the industry, a phase to deliverable that is going to hopefully provide new technical solutions to the industry in terms of gaining this, this convergence. And there will be an important um, part of the work that is also the liaison with certain bodies, nam namely with the 3GPP in this case, and also with IETF for standardizing certain key components, okay? In terms of the IoT work group, I'd like to highlight that we'll be starting the IoT and Smart Home activity next week, next Tuesday. If you, in fact, you have the opportunity to join the call, you'll be naturally very, very welcome. It will be led by Vial Giban from, from Reliance Geo and Fatme Fazel from Intel. This program is going to bring the CSA matter protocol into the residential space and look in terms of developing some uh, deployment guidelines for the service providers in terms of adopting matter and inter in developing interoperability with other analysis technologies as well. Uh, namely, for instance, as a sensing technology, but many others as well that come into the residential space. Wi-Fi Halo for IoT applications is already taking place. Fantastic momentum, really. The team is developing right now a market requirements document, lead leading really uh, the, the key benefits of these Wi-Fi base technology for the long range low power um, vertical within the industry and in terms of moving to the next gen work group we can just provide you guys a quick highlight that the Wi-Fi experience for moving networks is all about looking in terms of optimization of an uptake rate of Wi-Fi in terms of these mobility sectors, these moving networks, right? So certain uh, moving platforms as aircrafts, uh, cruise ships, right? 
uh, trains, uh, bus, bus transportation. So all these different verticals, right? They have specific conditions because they are on the move and we are trying to optimize that user experience and propose to the industry the way to standardize and gain a lot of momentum and traction in terms of the usage of Wi-Fi there. Operator managed Wi-Fi in terms of uh, developing this key technical reference architecture in WBA that uh, looks in terms of what do the operators want for their managed Wi-Fi features and how they can really pick up with a specific reference architecture and talk with all different vendors so that they can have a, a much easier negotiation process, much easier easier adoption process whenever they are deploying new features, new technology, or just changing a provider. Okay, This is a very important group that also is taking place in WBA. And we are now moving towards the phase two with more advanced features. You guys might have seen in the, the latest working sessions uh, two weeks ago in Las Vegas that we've had a, a set of four demonstrations. Um, so very, very interesting momentum really led by Operator Managed Wi-Fi Group in WBA. Then finally, Wi-Fi 7 uh, already coming to the entry with the first very important level in terms of the capabilities and the specific verticals and use cases that Wi-Fi 7 technology can address better than ever. So I would like to invite you guys as well to keep uh, keep tuned on that and have the opportunity to download the file once uh, once available to the members. So over the next days, we'll be broadcasting a message to all members on Actionet, basically. And I imagine that uh, you guys will for sure receive that notification to download that uh, first the liberal. And I, I would really invite you guys to have a look, uh, quite insightful, uh, particularly within new verticals and new technical capabilities that maybe some people are not yet aware that Wi-Fi 7 is really bringing to the industry. So very exciting, the liberal, really. Now, in terms of the roaming or group, we are looking in terms of this year with signaling location information in radius. This program is looking in terms of understanding the location of APs and the location of the networks, essentially. Very important for certain use cases. It's an ongoing work. We'd like to invite you guys, of course, to stay tuned into that as well. And we are moving towards as well understanding if we have the right conditions to start the decentralized open roaming networks program, looking in terms of open roaming more from a Web3 or decentralized perspective standpoint, maybe introducing blockchain perspective to look at that uh, side opportunity for open roaming. Finally, with the open roaming work group here, I think it's important to share with you guys, as, as my colleague Steve has mentioned, that open roaming is seeing a tremendous traction across the world. It's being deployed as we speak in multiple different uh, venues, multiple different cities as well. It's very interesting to see the vertical application that different companies take uh, to open roaming, the way they become identity providers, right? Very often to solve problems that they've had for many years in terms of the way they connect their users and different types of users into the networks, the way they apply policy. So this is how many companies are using open roaming these days. And the work that is taking place within the open roaming work group is very much focused right now in terms of the integration with private 5G and then looking in terms of the future release for IoT, all right? So these are the two key main building blocks that will take place uh, right after in open roaming work. Now, finally, testing and interoperability work group, typically looking in terms of the, you know, testing uh, pass point features, testing leading edge Wi-Fi technology, um, looking in terms of the user experience, the security, right? This is the core focus of this group. And we have a lot of work happening right there as well. Uh, we can see the access network metrics program, for example, looking in terms of uh, the performance and healthiness of even networks, right? Collecting those metrics, calculating uh, the, the performance analytics really, and then reverting that information back to the different stakeholders. This is very important for a certain set of use cases as well, as you guys, of course, might might imagine the the end twin Wi-Fi KOS or quality of service look in terms of how can we apply stream classification services tags to different traffic sources so that we, the network owner can then manage the the traffic differently and in fact have a prioritization and allocate for example the highest capability to a given set of the uh, application that is more that's more important therefore optimizing and improving drastically the performance of that specific application so this is a work that is taking place right now in end-to-end -end Wi-Fi QoS also with a very interesting deliverable to the intro I'd like to invite you guys to if possible download as well radius accounting assurance is looking in terms of optimizing you know all the radius problems uh, that sometimes occur, right? So building uh, inaccuracies that take place whenever there are some, some roaming exchanges. Very important to make sure that we resolve these inaccuracies so that we optimize in general the, the Wi-Fi roaming business for all the different parties. And then venue requirements for user engagement is looking in terms of moving from a more, you know, when, when we're talking about the venue perspective, right? Moving from a more captive, you know, 
friction-based experience to a more seamless based experience with Passpoint technology, of course, naturally with open roaming as well. So how can we guarantee that the venue can retain their user engagement points with the end users uh, moving from these captive to a more seamless approach with Passpoint and open roaming, right? This is the core goal. And finally, at the bottom, just very quickly, Pulse and Regulatory Affairs Work Group looking in terms of different consultations to worldwide regu regulators. Uh, the market work group bringing together the members of WBA to work on marketing activities and business related activities. And finally, the certification task group is a certification uh, you know, element that we have within WBA that is organized and ready so that whenever there is a specific testing stream that leads to certification, we are ready to, we are ready to implement it. So I, I hope I'm not taking too much more time. I would like just to allocate eventually around five minutes now to discuss with you guys two new important activities that are coming into play within the WBA. The first one being the Asia Pacific Task Group. All right. This initiative has been already uh, discussed with Asia Pacific members in uh, in June. And we are moving forward now with the next steps that when we'll, we'll give you guys insight in, in terms of what are those next steps immediately. But just before we go there, just to let you know as well as you might have seen. So we are also driving forward the sustainability task group. And as we have mentioned uh, several times, how is it possible that we have not talked more about sustainability, knowing that Wi-Fi technology specifically has such a strong value proposition when it comes really to its lowest, lower uh, uh, impact, right? And, and uh, that is such an important value proposition as well for technology itself. But without taking too much more time, I would like now to propose that we focus a little bit on the Asia Pacific Task Group, just to let you guys know exactly what is being discussed, what is being planned, and the, and the type of companies that will also be involved here, and naturally leaving a call to participation to you guys to be involved as much as possible. Okay, so very briefly, just to let you know. So we've had our first meeting in the beginning of June. Okay, this has been a briefing. Basically, we invited, uh, we hope, of course, the vast majority or the, the totality of the Asia Pacific members of WBA. We tried to get them all in a single meeting and we introduced exactly why, firstly, the staff of WBA were seeing the Asia Pacific Task Group as a very important initiative. Uh, basically, uh, offline as well, we had pre preliminary discussions as well with certain key members to understand if this was also seen by them as an important initiative to really get closer to the Asia Pacific members, right? Because we know that very often it's so hard for the members from this region to attend the regular WBA uh, meetings, right? Technical meetings, because it's so late in the morning very often to them and to you guys, right? So here what we thought is, okay, let's try and talk with the member companies to see if we can organize a specific task group that is much more favorable to the Asia Pacific members happening on, their, on your afternoon time. And then looking in terms of... Uh, the type of work that we can develop so that it's not only a, a one-way sharing information right from from the staff of WBA to the members but that we can really help the members developing work themselves work that is relevant not only to their organizations but to impact the entry as much as possible all right so this has been the proposal and we are very excited to see that there has been a, a very good level of adoption really from from the members and excitement around this initiative a lot of different companies have shown that they were they, they were keen to have an initiative like this and they are very interested to participate okay so the the slide that you can see here let me just close this one the slide that you can see here very quickly is a, a very simple draft with the, the next step. So right now we are going through this scope definition and leadership members. The leadership, the leadership team is very important really for us to bring together, you know, the key players that will be driving this work forward, right? These are the drivers, the leaders. We know that not everyone wants to take this role. Therefore, selecting those, you know, two, three, four companies that will be taking the leadership is, is incredibly important really to make sure that we are able to drive impactful work to the industry and secondly as well the scope right so deciding what this group is going to focus on because there are essentially two different uh, um, options this group could either develop a unique uh, work stream something that is not done entirely in WBA and is unique to this group or it could use the time and use a specific time slot to really provide contributions to the other groups in WBA 
all right, to the other ongoing work that is taking place in the WBA. And naturally, uh, at least from our humble standpoint, we believe that the most interesting would be to develop new and unique work. And therefore, we are going to work with the members now to try and develop that, that project scope. Okay. Then eventually, of course, we, when we get to the August time frame, the plan is to eventually start kicking off this initiative. Let's see if it's already possible to start the initiative or, for, or if, for example, we would need to submit a project proposal, a terms of reference TOR document to the next call for, for project. Uh, process that takes place every year in WBA. Let's see exactly what are the conditions that we have to start work immediately. And then finally, of course, planning to have the closure, the publication process around 2024 next year. All right, for this eventual first deliverable. But just to let you guys know very briefly, the set of feedback that we have collected so far, uh, 10 companies have already shown their interest in terms of being active within this program here. And we'd like to be as transparent as possible. 10 companies, when we are looking in terms of uh, the call for projects process that takes place in WBA, having feedback specifically from 10 companies is quite positive. We know that many others will want to be involved, right? But we know that there's also a difference. Sometimes the companies don't have either or the bandwidth or they don't they didn't see the, the email, right? So having these 10 companies really voicing their preferences has been super important. And we're very thankful to that. We can see that, for example, on the left column, we have four members willing to take the leadership in this group. That's outstanding, really. We have five more that are willing to be active contributors and one that is still deciding exactly the role that he wants to play, but most likely keeping a more passive or observant role within this group, right? Then in terms of uh, deciding whether we go for a new activity or contributions to the other ongoing programs in WBA, we see that the, it's spread across, right? That's why we need now to talk with these key companies here and discuss with them. The three saying that we should go for a new initiative, four saying that, okay, it's uh, between new, new initiative or contributions, it's either way. And then uh, the two of them saying that, okay, they would prefer a contribution type of, type of work, right? Finally, when it comes to the preferences, you can see that the vast majority has been placed around open roaming and the convergence between Wi-Fi and 5G, these two topics mostly. And finally, they are spread once again, the other contributions and preferences are spread across those topics such as residential Wi-Fi, IoT, voice over Wi-Fi and rural Wi-Fi. Okay. And basically the next step, just to finalize here, is really to organize this sync up with these 10 key members. It's already set for next Thursday, next week's Thursday. And the goal here, as you guys can see, is really to decide, okay, who is going to be part of the leadership team? Who wants to lead the charter of this group forward? Of course, with all the support from the PMO as always. And then what will be the one or two work areas that we are going to propose to the broader roster that is involved right now in the APAC task group? for eventually either voting or for putting to their consideration to hearing a little bit more to edit those work proposals so this is the path that we're proposing to move forward eventually leading to a very successful execution of um, a possible work area for example within the open roaming just to finalize could be for instance developing an open roaming business group in the wba and helping really the companies across the world not only the asia pacific members but really all over the world uh, learning how to implement better open roaming right how to monetize it better what are the options what can you do with the archive policy right so all those different topics could be for example explored in the asia pacific task group that is upcoming Okay, and with that said, I believe we are done for this part in terms of the, the technical roadmap update and also the Asia-Pacific task group um, update to you guys to let you guys know that this activity is taking place in WBA and you are very, very uh, welcome to join it as much as you can, of course. Okay. Thank you very much, Pedro, for that update. Uh, I think it's a great uh, move. Um, by launching the new APAC work group. Uh, I can see Bhuvnesh from HFCL is also on the session uh, and I know he's keen to take a leadership role. Uh, so very much looking forward to that as well. I think this forum, it provides a great opportunity uh, for members from APAC to participate also to shape the direction of wireless connectivity in the industry. Um, so if anybody would like to get involved, uh, please contact us as well. Okay. Very good. Um, Thank you. Yeah. If anybody has any questions for Pedro, uh, feel free to put them in the chat or unmute yourselves and we can also take them live as well. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'll pause one moment and then I think uh, if that's the case, no, no questions coming through, uh, we can move forward. Um, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Pedro. Yep. So, so next, I, I would like to invite our, our next speaker to the floor. So Debashish uh, Bhattachara uh, from the Broadband India Forum, welcome uh, to the session. Uh, so I know Debashish, you're going to 
be providing a, an overview of the wireless connectivity landscape in India. Uh, so thank you for coming along and, uh, and over to you. Thank you, Steve. Good morning to everyone. Good morning, good afternoon. Uh, <clears throat> let me share my screen. Let me see how, how good am I in doing that. Just let me know if it's, oh, one sec. You're there, it's on. Uh, you're, you're not on oh, presentation mode just yet. Uh, yeah, sure, I just need to get onto the presentation mode. One sec. Oops. Uh, are you guys able to see, uh, see my screen? We are, yep, all looks good. Thank you. Uh, once again, good morning and good afternoon to everyone. Uh, I'm going to make a short presentation about the public broadband landscape in India with special focus on Wi-Fi, public Wi-Fi, and uh, uh, focus around the uh, spectrum requirements of for public Wi-Fi, and also take you to the 6G vision that the government of India has just put out in the public domain. So my name is Debashish. I'm a senior DDG at Broadband India Forum. Uh, we, unlike, uh, we are not an industry lobby uh, or an industry group or association. We are actually an independent policy forum and a knowledge think tank for digital transformation. We work towards the enhancement and promotion of all aspects of broadband ecosystem, both uh, in terms of, and in a completely non-partisan and a completely neutral manner. We do not favor one technology vis-a-vis -vis other, and we actually believe there's scope for promoting everything together. Uh, we also believe that we are very strongly wedded to the concept of the Digital India campaign, which started by which was started by the government eight years ago, and uh, we are working uh, together with very, all stakeholders, including the government, to make sure that you know the right policies and regulations are put in place to accelerate the achievement of Digital India. And our focus uh, remains uh, on inclusivity. It's a very strong uh, goal of ours or a theme that we are very strongly wedded to. It's called uh, uh, broadband for all and therefore inclusivity, which means inclusive for everyone, whether it's uh, the high income group, low income group, urban, rural, people gender specific, whether it's male, female, the people with disabilities, we take them very seriously. We believe everyone should have a device which enables broadband for everyone. Uh, a little bit of about where the world is going, the trend. Uh, this particular slide talks about the, uh, the majority of the data consumption that happens today globally and as well as in India. Uh, is basically from the indoor uh, networks where the indoor uh, areas actually comprise or they actually consume about 80 to 90%, 95% of the overall traffic. And uh, as, I'm, as the slide shows, what are the applications? Mostly they are retail, indoor, home, as well as enterprise, massive IoT and the new immersive uh, reality applications, which are now coming up thanks to the uh, promotion of Wi-Fi 6E and Wi-Fi 7 in the unlicensed six gigahertz band. Uh, so that kind of sets the context for what I'm going to speak hereafter. So there's a lot of focus around the Wi-Fi uh, usage and the Wi-Fi technologies. Today we have Wi-Fi 6 and Wi-Fi 6E being shipped at the rate of about three to four million, uh, four billion devices globally on, a, uh, on an annual basis. And we believe the future is about Wi-Fi 7 and Wi-Fi 8 thereafter. Uh, as, as far as the indoor technologies and on the outdoor side or the mobile broadband side, you have 5G today and then 6G in the horizon in about five years from now. Uh, where we are, uh, a little bit about public Wi-Fi, I straight away would jump into public Wi-Fi. So uh, there are data trends that show that traffic on Wi-Fi today exceeds the traffic on mobile and fixed broadband networks together. 
that's an important trend because uh, it shows that there's a lot of uh, Wi-Fi, uh, a lot of indoor traffic, which in, which most of it is used on Wi-Fi. Uh, the majority of the high capacity downloads uh, on mobile networks as well as Hold on one second. Sorry, there's some background noise. Um, if you're not speaking, I think we'll try to mute the panelists. One second, Devash, we're just uh, sorting it. Yeah, thank you. I think it's, it's been muted now. Thank you. So, yeah, thank you. So uh, majority uh, with this uh, trends also show that the majority of the data downloads, high capacity, data downloads and data uploads happen when the persons are in a fixed or a stationary location and they use Wi-Fi instead of mobile broadband. That's an important uh, uh, trend. And uh, today in India, what we see, most of the Wi-Fi hotspots that we have are basically are, you know, from the legacy telcos networks. And they've been uh, sanctioned or they've been permitted to do public uh, Wi-Fi hotspots uh, as a part of their licensed activity that they have. But it's very few and far between. And anyway, unless you are a subscriber of the telcos network, you cannot use that Wi-Fi uh, network that the telco provides. So it's kind of limited. The public Wi-Fi hotspots in India today are less than half a million. Though the government has very ambitious targets to set, uh, which have been set for public Wi-Fi hotspots, but currently we are just about half a million, which is about uh, one by one seventy-five or one seventy-fifth of what UK has, a seventy-fifth of what China has, and a fiftieth of what US has in terms of number of public Wi-Fi hotspots. And despite the fact that India has a sixth of the global population, we have about one by 175 of the global average in terms of number of public Wi-Fi hotspots per million of population. So if you take that as the index, we if we are at one, the global average is at 175. So it's a huge gap and a huge opportunity there are therefore for people to actually use this uh, this huge gap and bridge this gap this is the challenge that and the opportunity that we have in front of us so we need public wifi hotspots and a lot of them uh, some other uh, points that need to be elaborated it is very clear and it's understood that due to intrinsic rf issues mobile broadband cannot guarantee data speeds. You can get very high data speeds now and then another uh, five minutes goes by and the mobile data speeds drop can drop dramatically. So because th this is how the physics is, so you cannot guarantee data speeds. So to get good quality mobile data service and higher speeds, the mobile networks actually, whenever the high down capacity downloads or uploads are required, they need to take the uh, support of Wi-Fi to be able to do what is called data offload or mobile data offload, MDO. Uh, this is something that unfortunately many of the telcos don't agree, but they, they need to understand that this is very important. And therefore the role of Wi-Fi is therefore critical and it should be seen as complementary to the mobile data networks and not seem to be competing with the mobile net data networks as is the case in most of the places. Uh, the other significant thing that I wish to point out is the cost of Wi-Fi data is inherently cheaper than mobile data. As per our Indian regulatory estimates and which I think is no different than what has been established in other parts of the world, the cost of Wi-Fi data, this is, of course, a little dated information. It was done in 2016, was two paise. Two paise is like two cents per megabit, as against mobile data, which was at that time at 11 cents or 11 paise per MB. So you can clearly see the, the factor of one is to six between cost of Wi-Fi vis uh, data vis-a-vis -vis cost of mobile data. Assuming that since 2016, the cost of Wi-Fi data would have gone up because the cost of equipment would have uh, gone up. 
but however, we believe it's, it would still be a fraction of the cost of mobile data, which has gone up significantly in India over the past two years alone, it has gone up by 40%. So therefore, our uh, key takeaway is that Wi-Fi still remains the most cost-effective and most affordable means for data consumption in a developing country like India, which has got almost 70% rural, connect, uh, rural uh, population as compared to the total population. Uh, uh, taking that forward, uh, what, do, what is the current state of the uh, broadband uh, situation in India? We have about 850 million broadband connections, 97% of which is on mobile. Unfortunately, uh, not all of it is unique users because uh, people in urban areas, people like us, like me, for example, I have at least three broadband connections. I have one on my, on my hand, I have one at home, and then I have one more at the office. So uh, if you take that as unique subscribers, I would, if I'm having on an average about 1.5 as the average uh, number of connections per user, you would have approximately about 500 to 600 million users, which means for a country like ours, which has 1.4 billion people, there are at least 800 million people who don't have access to mobile uh, to broadband at all. And most of them come from the rural areas. So given the low ARPU from such uneconomic air zones, areas, and high coverage, and because of the cost of coverage for mobile data networks, it is therefore public Wi-Fi becomes the only affordable alternative to provide quality con con connectivity and the desired coverage. Uh, so therefore we believe that it is important for Wi-Fi to coexist with mobile broadband, while mobile broadband may be the, uh, the choice or the, the connectivity medium of choice in the urban areas, Wi-Fi is extremely important for a country like ours with the rural and remote areas where it's, this is where it's likely to grow. I would now jump to a government related, a government led initiative called PM Wani. PM Wani, the full form of Wani stands for Wireless Access Network Interface. This was uh, developed indigenously, and the PM uh, was added to that was because the government decided to adopt this particular uh, uh, protocol for, gen for delivering public Wi-Fi hotspots. And what PM Vani does is it's basically a grid of public Wi-Fi hotspots put together. So uh, these are some of the features, but what is the most important feature is that you see, uh, you can have a public Wi-Fi hotspot married to a, a particular service provider and an ISP or a TSP. But unfortunately, you cannot, once you move out of the zone of that particular hotspot and you walk into another ISP's uh, mobile hotspot zone, you will find it, uh, you will not be able to uh, carry out the session unless and until you have um, uh, you, you know, you have uh, basically, uh, you have an association with the other ISP. To be able to ensure seamless and interoperable uh, connectivity and communication between multiple hotspots belonging to different service providers, that was the reason why uh, the Wani architecture was discovered and that's why the genesis of PM Wani. So what it does is it basically allows uh, a, a consumer once it is connected to one of the hotspots, as long as they are PM Vani enabled, they can actually roam between one network and another network in a seamless and interoperable manner. And the authentication and the payment, uh, the charge that they they pay for the for the broadband for the broadband connection can actually be seamlessly transferred from one network to the other. And so they don't have to sort of log in every time, authenticate themselves every time, and they don't have to make a fresh payment to the new service provider. So these are, this is the basic reason why uh, the PM Wani came into being to ensure that there is interoperable and seamless connectivity. And there are some new entities that have been designed around it. There's a, there's a PDO, a PDOA, I'll just uh, briefly expand upon it. PDO stands for a public data office. 
uh, PDOA is the guy who actually aggregates. It's a, it's a public data office aggregator. Then there is an app provider who, and you get your app, uh, the PM Money app downloaded on your handset. So whenever, wherever you get PM Money hotspots, it automatically shows up. The SSID shows up. It also shows up in case there are multiple SS, uh, hotspots belonging to different uh, you know, PDOAs. It'll show you which of the SSIDs are the most powerful ones so that you can latch on to the one which is most powerful and available. So, and of course, there is a central registry, which is CDOT, which actually manages the entire network, so to say. The uniqueness of this is that it gives you, it, it doesn't require any license fee. So this is unique to this particular uh, service. Of course, it is only meant for Wi-Fi, for selling public Wi-Fi service and no other service. You can't do an ISP or a TSP uh, service using this particular uh, um, authorization. It allows you one-time OTP flexibility in tariffs because you can set your own tariffs. It has got this ability to set up hotspots, public hotspots on a plug and play model. And there's you can sell data from the, the PDO to the end consumer and the end consumer in turn can actually help service something else. So there is a complete, uh, the whole purpose is to ensure that, you know, this is uh, kind of uh, leads to um, almost uh, similar, you get the similar sense or experience that you get while you're on a mobile. When you move from one location to the other, you don't have to every time log in and freshly authenticate yourself or make some fresh payments to the new service provider. So it depends, uh, once roaming is in, in, in place, automatically these things are taken care of at the back end. So that's the key advantage of PM Money. Uh, one essential attribute for new Wi-Fi, new technologies and new innovations coming up in, uh, in the world and especially in India now, is the need for the six gigahertz band to be unlicensed so that we can usher in Wi-Fi 6E and Wi-Fi 7 in India because there's a huge need for it. Uh, this increases the spectrum availability for Wi-Fi by nearly 5X because today we have barely about 600 odd megahertz of Wi-Fi unlicensed spectrum. And uh, by just bringing in another 1200, you can grow this by about three to four or even five times. Uh, the, it improves rural broadband connectivity, something that uh, given the fact that India today uh, has missed its targets, which was 5 million hotspots, public Wi-Fi hotspots by 2020 and 10 million by 2022. Uh, but the, the country is upbeat about the fact that because uh, in the new 6G vision document by the government of India, they have targeted to have 50 million, 50, 50 million public Wi-Fi hotspots by 2030. So there's a huge opportunity ahead of us for those who are in the Wi-Fi or the public Wi-Fi space to be able to exploit this uh, government target and to sort of uh, be able to use this opportunity to bring about the public Wi-Fi revolution, which this country uh, desperately needs. This also enables uh, TSPs to do mobile data offload, the six gigahertz, it improves the quality of speeds because we believe once you are able to offload the data to the Wi-Fi networks, the quality of service and the mobile data speeds also improve. And thereby, you know, the TSPs uh, get brownie points as well as uh, better, more customers as a result of this. It also ensures that uh, new innovative technologies and services are available, which will be enabled through new devices like Wi-Fi 6E and Wi-Fi 7. It brings in new immersive uh, applications like immersive reality, AR, VR, MR, use cases like SRDs, short range devices, like wearables. It can make broadband connectivity available to all Indians, which is also a, a overall overarching goal as such. This particular technology, uh, particular spectrum band allows for seven new 160 megahertz channel without interference from previous generation devi Wi-Fi devices and thereby helps the six uh, potentially serve as a multi-lane superhighway for the latest Wi-Fi devices. So in our opinion, 
entire six gigahertz needs to be de-licensed for rapid socioeconomic growth. Uh, I would like to briefly touch upon the government of India's 6G roadmap for those who are interested. Uh, the government launched their 6G vision document uh, for India. It was launched a couple of few months ago. And this 6G vision document has six sections in it, which includes things like multi-platform next generation networks, spectrum policy, multidisciplinary uh, innovations, devices, standard contributions, and financing research and development. India has, of course, made, uh, just uh, for FYI, made significant contributions to the finalization of the ITU 6G vision document that got finalized recently in Geneva in Working Party 5D. Uh, the 6G alliance has been constituted, um, which has a multi-stakeholder um, interest. And uh, just as I mentioned, the 6G vision roadmap that the government has set has targeted 50 million public Wi-Fi hotspots. And just to set the context, we are today at less than half a million. So there's a huge, huge opportunity ahead of all of us in the public Wi-Fi space. Thank you very much. I'm at the end of my presentation and I'm open for any questions. Thank you. Uh, we are running over slightly as well. Uh, there's a, I don't know if you can do it, answer this question very quickly, but what is the plan for private 5G spectrum for enterprise in India? Okay. So the government came up with, a, the, the government has already decreed that there are four methods by which pri private 5G networks will be set up in India. The first three methods involve the telcos, there is a fourth method wherein the government talked about giving direct spectrum allocation to the enterprise if they applied for it. Now, uh, while the telcos are uh, method, uh, the method of, of getting the private 5G installed using the telcos uh, is, is, uh, is um, on the cards, the, uh, the, I, the government uh, decision to actually allocate spectrum directly to the enterprises has run into a bit of rough weather. And uh, currently as things stand, that's been put on hold and okay. it has not been, it is not being permitted. Okay. So if anybody wants to set up sure. an enterprise private 5G, it has to be through the telcos. Okay. As thank you, Devesh. Um, thank, thank you for the uh, presentation uh, as well and for taking the question as well. Okay. Um, so moving on, uh, we actually have a recorded presentation from one of our members, Heights Telecom, uh, who's going to be uh, covering the topic of residential uh, Wi-Fi as well. So, um, Sarah, are you okay to to uh, to play the recording? Good morning, good afternoon. My name is Christian, Christian Gabetta. Uh, I'm the managing director for Heights Telecom. I'm based in Zurich in Switzerland. And it's a great pleasure for me to, to be here today with you. I would like to share with you some innovation activities that we, we think that the industry is going through at the moment and how uh, we need to work together to achieve uh, those objectives and goals. Um, we believe that uh, the industry is really evolving very rapidly in terms of uh, Wi-Fi, especially in uh, home gateways and extenders. We have seen a very fast movement from Wi-Fi 5 to Wi-Fi 6, now moving to Wi-Fi 6E and soon Wi-Fi 7. So the question is how uh, service providers are able to cope uh, with that uh, fast change and make sure that they can monetize uh, the network. Um, we believe that the uh, house of the future would require to have a home gateway which is capable to support uh, multiple services and applications. So in essence, instead of having a monolithic device where each house will have the same software uh, running, the idea would be to have in the home, similar to what we see on mobile phones today, on smartphones. We, we all enjoy different kind of platforms, uh, but we have our own applications. Yes, we do have some common themes like photographs or telephony or messaging systems 
but then we, we end up having different kind of applications uh, depending on what we would like to, to do with our phones. And I think the house is moving in that direction as well. So for that, um, I think that offering a virtualized environment, a containerized uh, CP is going to be very important for CSPs to make money in the future. Uh, in our case, we, we work with uh, various um, third-party software companies and we think that that's probably an approach that we are, see, we are going to see more and more uh, frequently. Uh, to be able to uh, have in the house um, the ability to support uh, Wi-Fi management solutions, advanced Wi-Fi management solutions, the ability to do QoS, the ability to prioritize traffic, the ability to implement cybersecurity, parental control, um, Wi-Fi sensing, um, and uh, more and more we think also that the IoT will become a pivotal service that service providers should consider uh, deploying. The question is, how does the service provider uh, play a role uh, in that area? Uh, we believe that it's, uh, it's needed uh, for the industry to adopt a software architecture that will allow service providers to implement uh, different software components and the service provider becomes a, a service for the customers to not only providing the access but also be able to provide them with uh, services that they can monetize so they can actually sell these services as a subscription perhaps uh, that uh, end users will pay for if they if they really see value in doing that but how does it link with technology uh, we think that uh, over the next couple of uh, years, we're going to see a big evolution on how these CPEs are managed. And um, at Heights, we are manufacturing hardware and software. So we believe in open standards. And um, we believe as well that it's very important to provide APIs uh, for CSPs to have choice. So CSPs will be able to uh, uh, cut uh, relationships and develop relationships with uh, third-party uh, companies that will allow them to uh, deploy different kind of applications uh, on these devices. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, one area that we think uh, is going to grow um, is the IoT in the house. And um, people will continue to buy devices as they normally do, uh, on the internet, whether it's an Amazon or whether they go to the local shop uh, to buy cameras or security devices or smoke detectors or energy management devices. Uh, but the role that the CSP could play uh, could be very interesting because if the gateway uh, is capable to support these devices, means that uh, it will be able to talk Wi-Fi with them, it will be able to talk matter uh, with them, uh, whether it's Thread, whether it's Zigbee, whether it's BLE, um, it will position the CSP in a uh, center uh, of the relationship with the customer. So with that in mind, um, we believe that gateways, as I said before, will become more and more intelligent and more and more flexible. Uh, and that's a role that uh, the CSP can, can play uh, in the future to monetize and to offer new services to their customers. Um, we have seen as well uh, that in certain geographies, uh, the ability to, to do passpoint um, is important because uh, the delivery of uh, data on a mobile network, whether it's a 4G, 5G network, uh, could be very expensive. Um, and we also have observed that uh, most of the data is really generated when people are not really necessarily moving. So these would be perfect scenarios where Wi-Fi could play a very important role. So we think that uh, aligning passpoint uh, with uh, home gateways could be an interesting uh, activity to do um, and that's a key activity that at Heights uh, we are doing. We're really taking uh, Passpoint uh, very seriously and we're already uh, on a journey to get uh, that in place. Lastly, and the, this will be my final remark, uh, is about design. Uh, people uh, argue uh, what is the definition of a good-looking or a bad-looking uh, Wi-Fi device? And to be honest with you, I don't think there is a, a right answer. I think it depends on taste, it depends on multiple things. But what is true is that as we evolve with Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi 5, Wi-Fi 6, 6E, 7, um, what is important is that the consumer, the end user, doesn't hide away these devices in, uh, in a cupboard. The idea is to come up with designs that people 
will be happy to keep those devices uh, in places where the Wi-Fi can be radiated and, and can operate properly. So at Heights we are taking design very seriously and uh, we think that uh, it's an important element, um, hence the reason we pay a lot of attention uh, and I'm very proud to say that uh, last year we've uh, been awarded with a Red Dot Award uh, for the best design on uh, home gateways and uh, Wi-Fi extenders. Lastly uh, is the importance of Wi-Fi 7. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time today but I think that Wi-Fi 7 is still a little bit far out uh, although we are going to see uh, CSPs deploying Wi-Fi 7 but in my opinion it will be more of a marketing activity still uh, expensive um, it is still um, in, in the direction of growing let's say um, but uh, as a businessman I think that uh, we need to focus on how do we help service providers to generate revenues how do we help service providers to transition from Wi-Fi 5, Wi-Fi 6 to the next generations of Wi-Fi 7. So um, if, you, if you're interested to, to reach out to us, please do that. Uh, we are willing to, to work with software companies. Uh, as I said before, we, we offer a platform um, that enables uh, service providers to integrate a wide range of third-party applications. And uh, we're looking forward to hopefully meeting you in the, in the near future. Thank you. Okay, so again, that session was uh, was uh, pre-recorded by Christian Gabetta uh, as well. So I'll take back the screen, and um, I'm going to actually close the session. We're running a little bit over, um, so I just uh, want to share a couple more slides. Um, I think if any of the uh, content and what you've seen today. Um, is of interest, uh, please do contact us. Uh, we would love to have more people and more organizations involved as well. You can see here, um, you know, a, a link on our website and my email address as well. And also I just want to share the um, schedule for the for the rest of the year. Uh, so this in fact is our last APAC forum uh, for 2023. Um, our next event, and I'll show more details in a moment, will be our Wireless Global Congress in Paris uh, in October. And we also are hosting uh, one more uh, online event, our Innovation Forum, um, on the 15th of November, which will be chaired by our CTO group and our own CTO, Bruno Thomas, as well. Okay. Uh, again, for our um, our last uh, Wireless Global Congress of the year, uh, this is a in-person event uh, and the opportunity to attend virtually. Uh, so for members, uh, the working sessions happen on the 23rd and 24th. And the Open Congress uh, will be on the 25th and 26th, again in, in Paris um, at the Port de Versailles. If there's any interest to participate and get involved, again, please contact us. We'd love to have you there as well. Okay. Uh, with that said, uh, I would like to bring this uh, APAC forum to a close and thank everybody for their attendance uh, and uh, look forward to hearing from you in the future.